Welcome to the Endless Knot podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Welcome to our second episode. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about a detective story, which is the second video I think that we put out. Yes, and uh, it's actually the, I think it has the oldest pedigree for all of these videos in that the initial kernel of this one goes back the farthest. It went through the most number of versions, so it got posted. It wasn't the first as a blog post, but the original idea of it was the oldest. And started how? Uh, it started, this is one of the ones that started off in the classroom. This came out of teaching uh, a class on literature in the context of the other arts and humanities. So it was sort of trying to uh, locate literary texts in a broader cultural world. Uh, literature, the arts and humanities, I think it was called. Right. And basically it was something that I kind of semi-improvised in the last class trying to wrap up the year and you know, referring to a bunch of texts that we'd done, that we looked at throughout the whole year. My basic premise in teaching that course was I wanted to show how nothing exists uh, in a vacuum, that everything brushes up against something else. And so I just sort of walked through the, the different, a number of the different texts we've looked at and showed, you know, look, this is connected to this, this is connected to this. We can understand them as a kind of interconnected whole. Right, which is as we've already said, the basic premise behind all the videos anyway, mm -hmm. and it's become sort of your leitmotif for all of the research you've been doing and the writing you've been doing since. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's called a detective story because its main characters are... Uh, Sherlock Holmes, and I've, you know, I've been a long time fan of Sherlock Holmes, and Sir Gawain, who, you know, the, the basic premise here is I make the argument that the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is essentially a detective story. And I, I have to admit, this is not an original idea to me. This is kind of a, based on an idea that an undergraduate professor that I had many years ago pushed the idea of the story as it's a story but all about paying attention to clues and sort of I, I sort of ran with this notion I think other people have, have kind of made this this point as well mm -hmm. and so I wanted since I was covering both of those texts in that class Gawain and Sherlock Holmes you want to show the parallels in the I want to show the, the parallels yeah. these are both detective stories they are they have this interesting literary parallel but how else are they connected and right. so I, then I followed that chain through Right, through various historical and literary connections and aesthetics and changes of, over time. Mm -hmm. Did you see the Toast article about Sir Gawain that was going around recently? Oh! Everybody was linking to it about uh, one of the the Toast, the online blog that does... Um, well, this, Mallory Ellis, I think, is the person who does all these sort of medieval-y ones, and that was boiling down at the Sir Gawain story. Yeah, 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 and I kind of, you know... Slightly jokey. Um, well, very jokey way, yeah. yeah. Like things like uh, trying to boil it down into what six or seven sort of panels of. Yeah. And uh, when Sir Gawain says, well, I, I, do, I don't want to have sex with you. If I have sex with you, Lady Bertilac, I'll have to have sex with your husband. And also, it goes against all the knightly virtues. Lady Bertilac says, That sounds like a Gawain problem, not a Lady Bertilac problem. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, things like that. Yeah, it was quite amusing. It was particularly funny to look at the comments on that post, in which those who already knew the story were laughing about how good it was. Yeah. And those who didn't were saying, Wait, does this make sense to people? Because it doesn't make any sense to me. And then people responding to them saying, Don't worry, it doesn't make any sense in the original either. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody understands the point of this story, which is. Uh, oversimplifying but it is it's a weird weird story it, it does show though how many elements in that story are not so far removed from kind of a modern aesthetic in a sort of in a way i mean the, the whole sort of bedroom sex farce kind of thing which we think of as a sort of in a sense a sort of modern thing is really medieval it's a really yeah. common medieval um story element so yeah and then, of course, Sherlock Holmes, as you said, which has been something you've loved forever and ever. Yeah. I, I mean, I started reading those since I was probably 12 or younger. Ah, oh, here comes the cat. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I've read them all as well. Uh, not my particular love, but I have certainly read the whole collected works and I've enjoyed them and I enjoy the various adaptations, in particular the, well... In particular, the Jeremy Brett ones. 
Yeah, yeah you're you're more of a, an Agatha Christie. Yeah, Agatha Christie is really my my first love in terms of them, and and there's other detective novelists mm-hmm. that I like, Dor- Dorothy Sayers and stuff. But but Sherlock, of course, is the the or text. It's the one that they all come off of. So that's yeah. well, of course, it's not the first that. detective story, <laughs> but it's the one that sets. The tropes yes. for Agatha Christie. It's the Christie. one that makes the, the one... genre really popular. Well, and and specifically, Agatha Christie is working from the Sherlock from Holmes Sherlock tropes, Holmes. and Dorothy Sayers is working against the Sherlock Holmes tropes. And I mean, he once Doyle has written, everybody's playing with that version. Nobody writes a detective story after Sherlock Holmes who isn't in some way reacting to Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, yeah. So. Well, and, and the point I often make uh, to students is that uh, even if you haven't read the Sherlock Holmes stories, you, you still already somehow know all the key elements, all the key yeah. elements, right? The, the icons, the, the deerstalker hat, the meerschaum pipe, the, the uh, magnifying glass are often used as... To just mean detective. To detective, yeah. right. So, in, in, you know, in a, in a library or bookstore, when, you mm-hmm. know, they'll put a, a, that hat as a, as a picture to show you these, these are the mystery books. It is literally the icon, yeah. yeah. And all as it, the, the phrases, even the ones that weren't actually from the books, but became the stock phrases from the various mm-hmm. adaptations, like Elementary, My Dear Watson, and those things. Yeah. Anyway, so why don't we play the voiceover from the video, and then we can come back and talk about it more, because in that, you actually tell the story of Gawain, for instance. Right. So that if people don't know, if you aren't up on your medieval romances for some reason... This can fill in those gaps, and then we can come back and talk a little bit more about the details of the voiceover. When I hear you give your reasons, I remarked, the thing always appears to me to be so ridiculously simple I could easily do it myself, though at each successive instance of your reasoning I am baffled until you explain your process, and yet I believe my eyes are as good as yours. Poor Dr. Watson. The great fictional detective Sherlock Holmes is famous for his amazing powers of deduction. Using keen observation and deductive reasoning, he is able to observe clues and work out the causes that lie behind any circumstance, a skill he frequently uses to solve crimes. He is able to see, in a way that other characters who inhabit Conan Doyle's stories are not, how seemingly unconnected facts can relate to one another. Other characters, such as his friend and companion Dr. Watson, are amazed and baffled until Holmes explains the deductive steps that led to his conclusions. Only then does the greater web of clues create a more complete and holistic meaning for both characters in the story, and for the readers as well. Presented only with the starting point and the final conclusion, the chain of deduction seems remarkable indeed. I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but sometimes the work of a scholar seems a little like piecing together clues into a meaningful whole. And so, I'd like to tell you a literary-slash-cultural-slash-historical detective story that begins and ends with Sherlock Holmes. Or rather, it begins with another detective, Sir Gawain, one of King Arthur's Knights of the Round Table, and perhaps the surprising suggestion that there is a connection between Sherlock Holmes and Sir Gawain. They are both detectives who have to follow a trail to solve a mystery, and they themselves are connected by a fascinating literary-slash-historical trail. This trail has lots of different connections. Sometimes there is an obvious causal link between one person or event and another, but sometimes the connection, while seemingly casual or accidental, reveals something about the cultural moment, the social movement, the larger context. Some of these connections work as our memory does. Two things that coincide may not strictly be related, but may seem so because one reminds us of the other. What I want to do here, by leading you through one such trail of connections, is to demonstrate how nothing in this world stands in isolation, and that, to know anything, we need to know everything. Okay, okay, I know that's impossible, but at least we can do our best to try and think about the larger context of anything we're interested in, whether it's a story, a historical event, a person, a philosophical idea, a technological development, whatever. Not only is this more likely to bring us real knowledge, it's also a whole lot of fun. And so, on my way to Sherlock Holmes, I'm going to start with Sir Gawain. To briefly summarize the story, in the early days of King Arthur's court, at around the time of Christmas and New Year's, all the nobles at court were feasting and celebrating, as befits that time of year. At one such feast, surprising everyone, a strangely green intruder burst into the hall riding a strangely green horse. I don't just mean that they were wearing green, I mean that both horse and man were completely green. The man carried with him two things, an axe and a sprig of holly. Holly had the same symbolic connection to Christmas then as it does now. Mercy, rebirth, salvation. The axe, both a weapon of battle and the instrument of the executioner's justice, had a special piece of lace wrapped around the handle. The strange green intruder proposed a game to the court, an exchange of blows. Gawain accepted the challenge on behalf of his king and court, and struck the head from the green knight using the axe. And now came the biggest surprise of all. The green knight picked up his own head off the floor, reminded Gawain of his promise to accept a return blow one year later, and rode out of the hall with his head carried under his arm. 
Thus begins Sir Gawain's detective story. He must gumshoe his way around the countryside trying to track down the Green Chapel where he must keep his bargain to the Green Knight, and along the way come to grips with the mysterious events that have precipitated this adventure. Unlike Sherlock Holmes, Sir Gawain is not actually a very good detective. He fails to pick up on all the clues presented to him. This is surprising considering that his personal symbol, which he wears emblazoned on his shield, is the sign of Solomon, a pentangle or five-pointed star, also referred to in the poem as the Endless Knot. It is so named because of its interconnectedness. One can draw a pentangle without lifting the pen from the page, and each point is connected to two other points in the star. It is indeed an interconnected endless knot. For Gawain, this symbol represents the interconnected nature of his code of honour as a knight of the round table. Furthermore, its connection to Solomon, a symbol of judgement from the Old Testament, represents his commitment to justice. Incidentally, on the inside of his shield Gawain has the image of the Virgin Mary, a symbol of mercy, and thus the shield graphically represents the same set of oppositions that the axe and holly symbolised, justice and mercy. But although Gawain's personal symbol is one of interconnectedness, he doesn't himself grasp the interconnectedness of the events which befall him. Sir Gawain heads out on a quest to find the Green Knight, and a few days before his appointment at the Green Chapel he comes upon an unexpected castle in the wilderness where he may celebrate Christmas, quite possibly the last one of his life. The castle is circled by a palisade and moat two miles away, with the grounds within this palisade belonging to the castle. He is warmly welcomed there, perhaps a little too warmly. His host, Lord Bertilac, tells him that the Green Chapel is less than two miles away, and suggests that they pass the time until the appointment with another game of exchange, this time between daily winnings. The host will go out on a hunt each day and exchange what he manages to catch with whatever Gawain wins staying at home in the castle each day. Unsurprisingly the host manages to hunt down a deer, a boar, and a fox. Gawain's daily winnings are somewhat more unusual. Each day his host's wife, Lady Bertilac, who is the femme fatale of this detective story, visits Gawain in his bedchamber and attempts to seduce him having heard of his fame as a chivalrous knight of King Arthur's court, who is as successful at wooing women as he is fighting on the battlefield. Gawain, of course, is in something of a quandary having agreed to the game of exchange. Anything he wins must be passed along to the host at the end of the day. Each day Gawain manages to squirm his way out of having an affair with Lady Bertilac, accepting only kisses from her, which he dutifully passes on to his host each evening. It's really quite a sexually charged poem, with kinky bondage sex talk between the host's wife and Sir Gawain, and the implication of potential homosexual sexual favours between Gawain and his host. Well, who said medieval literature is boring? However, on the third day he finally breaks his word. Lady Bertilac offers him her lace girdle, and if this seems a sexually charged gift, it is. She offers him an undergarment in much the same way that a groupie would throw her underwear at a rock star today, giving Gawain's rock star fame as one of the knights of the round table. Only it's not just any underwear, it's magic underwear. Lady Bertilac tells him that if he wears this lace he will be impervious to any harm. Now Gawain has a way of surviving the fateful encounter with the Green Knight, but only if he breaks his word and doesn't give up his winnings to his host that evening, and this is exactly what he does. Perhaps had Gawain not been so concerned for his life, not only would he have not broken his word, he might also have picked up on the clues that he was being set up. He had all the information he needed to deduce the meaning of this mystery, but unlike Sherlock Holmes he failed to see the connections. He had in fact already before seen the lace the wife gave to him around the handle of the axe the Green Knight was carrying and upon arriving at the castle he was told the Green Chapel was not two miles away and therefore within the walls surrounding the castle grounds. But he doesn't connect these and other clues to come to the conclusion that all these events are interconnected and that the outcome of the exchange of winnings game is tied to the outcome of the exchange of blows game. As it turns out, the Green Knight, who is of course his host at the castle in a magical green disguise, judges his error to be a minor one since he does it for fear of his life, an understandable human emotion, and only scratches Gawain with the axe rather than cutting off his head as had been promised. Gawain, however, learns his lesson. He chose poorly at the beginning of the story picking the axe of judgment rather than the holly of mercy, the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law, and therefore was caught in a life and death situation in which he didn't live up to his code of honour as a knight. Thus ends this detective story, one part of the larger cycle of Arthurian legends and romances. The Arthurian stories encapsulate the medieval mindset perhaps better than any other works of literature, with conflicts between religious belief, martial conquest, devotion to women in the courtly love tradition, and personal codes of honour. Of course, to a large extent this was an imaginary world. Already in the Middle Ages writers were looking back on a golden age of chivalry which never really existed, at least not in the way it was portrayed in courtly romances like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. But it was a powerful and resonant set of images and ideas, one which continued to be drawn upon by writers in successive ages. One such later age which drew heavily upon the medieval was the Victorian period in the latter part of the 19th century. Many Victorian writers, artists, and thinkers such as Alfred Lord Tennyson, William Morris, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Thomas Carlyle, and John Ruskin looked to the medieval for imagery, ideas, and inspiration. 
Again, it was something of a romanticization of a medieval golden age that never really existed in quite that way, but it was nevertheless a major part of the Victorian aesthetic. Tennyson is often thought of as the quintessential Victorian poet, reflecting all the many cluttered aspects of Victorianism, including Victorian medievalism. One of his most famous poems is Idylls of the King, a poetic retelling of the Arthurian story, though not of the story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Tennyson's poem is an attempt at writing the great British epic, with the Arthurian story reflecting on the British monarchy. Indeed Tennyson frequently reflects the concerns of his day, everything from the conflict between faith and science which was brought into sharp focus by the new evolutionary theories of the day, to the appalling social conditions that resulted from industrialization, sharply contrasted by the pastoral world of Arthurian legend. Indeed Tennyson was officially adopted as the poetic voice of the age when he was named Poet Laureate. One particular national issue which Tennyson wrote about after being named Poet Laureate was in his other most famous poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. This poem tells the story of a disastrous attack in the Crimean War. A misunderstood order caused the Light Brigade to charge, and they were all slaughtered. Tennyson seems to be celebrating the heroism of doing one's duty and courage in the face of defeat, qualities at the heart of the Victorian self-image. It was at the order of the commander of the British forces, Lord Raglan, that this disastrous attack was made. Speaking of Lord Raglan, or more properly Fitzroy Somerset 1st Baron Raglan, his great-grandson Fitzroy Somerset 4th Baron Raglan, also commonly known as Lord Raglan, was most famous for his scholarly work on the hero figure, and wrote about a variety of legendary heroes. Raglan's approach is to analyse the hero myth pattern that underlines such stories, such as Gawain's journey in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is very similar to the more famous hero myth pattern worked out by Joseph Campbell, which was, by the way, inspiration to George Lucas in developing the Star Wars storyline. In addition to describing the structural pattern of the hero figure in myths from many cultures, as Lord Raglan did, Campbell saw in this pattern an expression of the universal human experience of the coming of age story. Well, universal at least for boys growing into men. Young boy leaves home, accomplishes great deed, returns home a hero and a man. Campbell was in turn inspired by Sir James Fraser, who was also striving to find the key that would explain all myth everywhere. He wrote the highly influential study The Golden Bough, which examines the relationship between myth and ritual, in particular the idea of sacral kingship, the connection between a king and the lands he rules, and the fertility rituals surrounding this in many cultures throughout history and around the world. According to Jesse Weston's book From Ritual to Romance, inspired by Fraser's work, this is what lies behind the famous Holy Grail story of Arthurian legend, and this leads us back to King Arthur and Sir Gawain, one of the Grail Knights. But this is the red herring found in every detective novel, and not the real trail I want to follow. So instead, let's get back to the Crimean War and the world's first war correspondent William Howard Russell, who wrote about the general poor organisation and appalling conditions endured by the troops. Russell's dispatches, published in the Times, created much controversy and uproar back home, and as a result Raglan Sr. ordered his officers not to talk to Russell, but not before Russell's stories brought Florence Nightingale, along with a team of nurses she trained, to Crimea to see those poor conditions being suffered by the troops. Florence Nightingale became famous for her pioneering efforts in wartime nursing. But she wasn't the only notable nurse involved with the Crimean War. Rather less well known is the Jamaican nurse Mary Seacole. Seacole travelled from Jamaica to England to volunteer as a nurse for the Crimean War soldiers, bringing her knowledge of tropical medicine, including herbal and folk remedies. She was rebuffed by the authorities, at least in part due to racial prejudice since she was of mixed race. Seacole managed to raise money independently, and she went anyway, setting up her own hotel for the care of wounded soldiers, which she financed by selling food and drink to the soldiers. She is notable for sometimes treating soldiers on the battlefield under fire. Though the soldiers and military commanders seemed to appreciate her efforts, Nightingale herself was dismissive of Seacole, who after the war ended returned to England destitute. However, her plight was brought to public attention in part through Punch magazine, the famous satirical Victorian periodical. There was something of an explosion in periodicals in the 19th century, driven in part by cheaper paper and advances in printing technology. This allowed for low-cost mass circulation periodicals which, coupled with increased literacy rates, led to a market for popular literature, literature for the masses. Indeed there was a mini-explosion of printed media in the 19th century, what with periodicals, the proliferation of broadsheet newspapers, and the penny dreadfuls, lurid novels, which led to a kind of information overload similar in effect to the digital media explosion of our own time. This in turn led to more and more affective and even sensational content in order to grab the attention of the readers. Again, much like our own lurid tabloids and reality TV excesses, not to mention the internet. Richard Dickey Doyle was a famous Victorian illustrator who drew Punch magazine's first cover, and therefore designed the Punch masthead used for over a century. Doyle contributed various illustrations for the magazine, as well as illustrations for such famous Victorian authors as Dickens, Ruskin, Thackeray and Lee Hunt, often signing his initials RD with the Dickey bird standing on top. A few years later Richard Doyle's nephew came to prominence in the pages of another famous Victorian periodical, The Strand Magazine, feeding the public desire for sensational content such as stories about crime and other lurid topics with his stories about the detective Sherlock Holmes. 
So here the trail ends, leading from one failed detective, Gawain, through medieval literature, to Victorian medievalism and its Arthurian cycles, by such writers as Tennyson, who also wrote about important contemporary events like the Crimean War, with the notorious commander Lord Raglan and the war correspondent Russell, leading to public outcry and the work of Nightingale and Seacole, to her destitute condition as covered in Punch, originally designed by Dickie Doyle as part of the explosion of Victorian periodicals, to his nephew Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the culmination of a trail leading from our first fictional detective to the infallibly successful fictional Sherlock Holmes. Viewed in isolation, all these people, events, texts, and ideas might seem to have nothing to do with one another, but as symbolized by Sir Gawain's endless knot, they form an interdependent web. And just as Sherlock Holmes' deductions become clear when all the intervening steps are revealed, tracing these connections can cast new light on each of the separate strands. And that's a detective story. One of the longest ones I think we've done. It yeah. has a lot of material in it and covers a pretty broad stretch of stuff. Yeah, one of the, I think, I mean, largely that comes from the fact that I tell a lot more of the story than I often do. I, if I do make a literary reference, I'm usually simplifying it quite a bit more. Yeah, telling all of the Gawain story, even in the most summary form possible, takes up a big chunk of the time. But I think it's worthwhile because it's a great story and, you know, I didn't know it particularly and I'm sure most people who don't study medieval literature don't know it. Even people who know their Arthurian myth may not know it because it's not really one of the ones that's most central to the basic story of Arthur. No, well, I mean, it seems to have been basically invented as a one-off for that poem and no one in the Middle Ages, it seems, really read or knew that story. It was written uh, way off in the countryside, away from London, and never got circulated in various manuscripts. One manuscript basically sat, you know, on a bookshelf for mm. several hundred years until someone found it. Right. So it had basically no impact on the larger Arthurian, Arthurian tradition. Romance, the romance yeah. stories. It, it draws on elements from other Arthurian stories. So you can sort of say, okay, this, this, this little idea comes from here, this little idea comes from there. But it didn't have influence on later stuff. Until when? Mm. When did it sort of re-enter the popular That's a or did it question. ever <laughs> it, well it did but i mean i think no earlier than the 19th century i think so um, when we're talking in fact that very victorian medievalism that you're talking yeah, about in the video yeah. by the time people are starting to look at arthurian literature in a kind of you know scholarly way uh, that's really when it becomes known i think so it doesn't have a direct impact on later late medieval literature and Not renaissance literature no. because it's it's often and so on unless the story was circulated in some oral form but there's no no, no signs no really that that, that no. it was an oral story yeah interesting i didn't know that and i guess the other thing in that story of course is the origin of the endless knot the name yeah and I, the logo and because it is a story about interconnection and paying attention to clues that you could miss but that are important things that don't seem to be connected but turn out to be turn out yeah. to be so i sort of picked it up as a, a nice phrase to to reflect that idea of course the, i mean this idea of the endless knot it's actually a reference to the celtic knot right, right. but that interweaving pattern so it is a it's visually a nice image for for this idea mm-hmm and then the logo um and you talk about this on the blog and on the website i think but then the logo of the endless knot that we use as the logo for the podcast, for instance, builds on that and also is connected to the cognitive... The cognitive science heptagram or hexagram, the different versions of it, that show how these different disciplines are all... Overlapping. Overlapping, well, and connected particularly for the project of looking at human cognition. You've got to look at language and anthropology and right. psychology. and So and it stands as a, so as a good emblem of, inter of interdisciplinarity. Yes. Right? Yeah. Even if there's a specific purpose there for the cognitive. I think the other nice thing this one demonstrates is the range of unconsidered connected things that you bring in because you said that at the beginning you started with the project or, or with the intention of showing how there's a parallel between Sir Gawain and Sherlock but in tracing those connections as you said you don't stick just to literary parallels or just make it an exercise only about showing how they both follow the same plot structure or have thematic elements in general yeah. you've brought in all of this history and 
politics and development of aesthetic and scholarly ideas. And that's, I think, really key to the, the larger project. Yeah, I mean, you know, everything should be fair game. Yeah. It, it just, you, you go where the idea takes you mm -hmm. uh, and what what interests you and you just sort of follow up on it. Mm -hmm. And some things... the way we live our lives, really. Yeah. You know, we don't... I mean, sometimes we do kind of put things in boxes, put things in pigeonholes. Mm -hmm. But for large portions of our lives, we're just sort of following from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. I think, in fact, I mean, people like to talk about how much humans like to categorize things and like to put them in boxes, that it feels easier and safer if you can say, that person does this, and this person is that, and this part of my life is this, set everything off in walled boxes. But that it's inevitably an untrue way of looking at the world and that when people do that it causes all sorts of problems like categories you know, i listen to other people talking about simple things like an actor gets typecast because they only do this that's the comic actor but of course nobody's that simple and so trying to resist that impulse to say oh i've labeled this now i know it because i can put a label on it and put it in a box I understand it, I can put it aside, and I never have to think about understanding it again. And the funny thing is how apologetic we get when we do break those sorts of rules, right? You, you'll, you'll say something like, well, it sort of seems crazy, but whenever I think of this, it always makes me want to do this or whatever, right? You, you, you have these, these kinds of impulses, impulses, mm -hmm. and yet we, we sort of always backpedal and say, you know, I it, this is just sort of a crazy thing that I do. It's just a per particular personal quirk or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and, and we all do it. Yeah, and as I'm, and I'm thinking again about things like genre or something. When you, when you cross genres, a TV show, people want to say, oh, this TV show is a horror TV show, or this is a comedy. You know, what was so weird about Buffy was that it was horror and comedy at the same right. time, and that was weird. And how do you do horror and comedy? Because people want to. And, and there's always an impulse from the commercial side of things as well to know you have to know what your demographic is, so you have to be able to be really specific and label everything. Uh, I'm, I'm using examples from, from kind of pop culture because I think that it's easy to see it there. But I think that impulse is, is often there in all sorts of parts of our lives. Yeah. On the one hand, our brain doesn't work like that. On the other hand, there's this tension between that and trying to make it easier because the world is so big and things are so interconnected and there's so much to understand that you feel like if you can just pin things down, pin things down yeah. say that you understand it and move on, it'll make things easier. But the more you do that, the less true your understanding of the world is. And people can get really trapped by those boxes. They can box themselves in by self-identifying yeah. and saying, this is who I am. I am X mm -hmm. and I am Y and I'm nothing else. And this means I can only do these things. And then you get really trapped in your own identity but you can do the same stereotyping for other people mm -hmm. all these sorts of things and so what's the remedy for that well one of them is always being open to thinking about the random connections between stuff as being meaningful and not trying to uh, dismiss them not as, trying to dismiss yeah. them or explain them away or pretend that they're not important that mm -hmm. they're not the core in importance yeah and you know force yourself sometimes at least to go outside of your comfort zone and the things you've self-identified yeah. as being the things you're good at and, or... and yeah play in someone else's backyard for a little while and you know see what you find see what what you can bring to it and what it can bring to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course the other tent pole for that one is is sherlock holmes as we mentioned before i'm a big fan of this and it it's become a big cultural i mean it sort of goes in waves obviously yeah there's been sherlock mania on and off i mean at the beginning obviously yeah. it was hugely hugely popular then there were all those adaptations in the 30s i think 30s and 40s yeah the tv adaptations and it's been on stage radio multiple and times and films. radio and, yeah. and then m huge numbers of films and then there was the jeremy brett series uh, which like in the 80s, yeah. which is still Excellent. I think at really the heart the of it, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. my favorite in the sense that I like others too. But I mean, that's mm -hmm. who Sherlock Holmes is in my head. And that's what I'd always go back to. But now we have an ongoing two TV series, really, one in, in, in the UK and one in the US, mm -hmm. but, but also a big uh, cinematic version. Well, several big cinematic several, several versions. Big cinematic. <laughs> two on, yeah, we had two series of cinematic versions and two ongoing tv series in the last five years or so five or six years so that i think you could call that a sherlock boom yeah, yeah. 
So it's, I mean, it's in, it's in the, the sort of popular sphere right at the moment. Mm. And one of the ideas that came, that became quite popular in BBC series is this memory palace thing, which suddenly right. was everywhere for, for a few years and people were referring to it and with this sort of popular round. And this, I mean, this goes back to, this is an actual thing that goes back to the middle ages, this, this method of Loki, which is, you know, this idea of harnessing one cognitive faculty to help with another, right? You use your spatial Pretty sure they didn't put it this way in the Middle Ages, but well, they kind of <laughs> did. They were pretty explicit about it. Um, that you use your. Oh, I was just thinking of cognitive. Oh, co fact. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although they had pretty sophisticated un attempts at understanding how minds how work, the mind yeah. work. Yeah. It's, um, it's actually quite quite interesting. But but yeah, using your your sort of spatial awareness as a way of helping you to remember stuff. Right. So you put things you want to remember in a physical location in your mind. Um, you imagine a physical location and you... A room, a room in a house a building or something. Yeah. Or whatever that you know, and then you can stock it with things. And it actually does, it does in a sense get picked up in, in the original Sherlock Holmes stories. Holmes refers to it in, in the Conan Doyle stories as the brain attic. Oh, okay. And you stock right. your brain attic with things. Right. It's not completely clear there that he's talking about putting them in physical locations in, in your mind to remember. He, though he is talking about keeping a well-ordered brain attic. So you've got right. to organize it. It's organized thought in some right. sense. Right. So yeah. Some sort of filing system and he, anyway. And he thinks of it as a sort of physical location right. like that. Right. Hello, cat. And then in the yeah, in the BBC show, it became, they, they used visuals because the way that show works to do this, that they've, they've, they're trying to do visual representations of the mind's working, which yeah. is an interesting element of that approach that that show is taking, using words and zooming in and zooming out and all of the camera angles and things. So they use the memory palace as a way of almost concretizing or making literal yeah. the process that Sherlock goes through in order to... So he stands there and actually moves, moves his hands around, around yeah. in his, as if he's moving things around. I, I did a gesture for the podcast audience. I'm sure that was very helpful that you've seen how I move my hands. Uh, but he did, does it. And then in that one episode where he meets the other person who uses the same metaphor, that evil genius guy. Yeah. And who people I believe take it's based it, on Charles Augustus Milverton in the stories. I don't remember. I've the, only seen it the, the once, so I, I don't remember yeah. it very well. But the blackmailer, but... And there, much of the plot hinges upon the fact that he keeps talking about it as if he keeps the files in a literal place. And then it turns out to be all in, all yeah, in, in his, his mind. mind. He yeah. talks about it as if he's got them in a physical location in mm -hmm. his basement or something. And then it turns out that he's using that same metaphor of mm -hmm. filing things in his brain. And there is no literal mm -hmm. physical place. Mm -hmm. And that actually becomes, spoiler alert, one of the big reveals mm -hmm. of the show. So that's where the Memory Palace one comes to the fore mm -hmm. in many ways. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I wonder to what extent we've, got, I mean, presumably we do have now other kind of metaphors for that database, you know, mm -hmm. filing metaphors, system and people, and filing system, well, people, filing cabinets. I think people so still use the filing cabinets because of course that's been carried over as a metaphor to computer files. Files. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and a filing system. Yeah. It'd be interesting to think about how people talk about that now. We use memory so... You know, people do talk about accessing their memory now. Yes, that's you know, true. And filling... But there's still this filling up metaphor as if it's a physical space that you pour water into. And right. Then, oh, you know, if, you, if I'm all filled up, I can't, I can't take in any more facts. Mm -hmm. I have to dump some before I get some more. And Our... it seems to some extent that is true is that one of the jobs that the brain has to do, for instance, when you sleep is, is dump trim. memory. Yeah, yeah. But it's... Memory is so very different for us than it was in the Middle Ages, for instance, in terms of what we externalize as memory. We have books, we have writing down, our memory is outside of us. And people joke now that your brain is in your phone. Right. But long before that, your brain was in your notebook, yeah. or your brain was in your calendar, or your brain was in your diary, or your Rolodex, or whatever. Your, yeah. your memory was in these physical things you wrote down. One of the reasons the Middle Ages has this, has many theories of memory, in fact, is because for a very large number of people, life was still pretty much an oral culture. Right. And so they aren't writing things down. And so they need, in a really direct way, to have ways of remembering large amounts of information. They yeah. need, this is a daily life problem, not just for strange geniuses mm -hmm. like Sherlock Holmes. 
um, Sherlock Holmes stands out in the Doyle as doing this, nobody else needs to do it because if you want to know something, you go look it up or you write it down and you remember it. And he's weird for using his memory this way, but it wasn't once so odd. It, it is interesting that you, kind of, you bring this up, that people sort of complain about, oh, well, people are no good at remembering things now because of uh, Google and whatever. And nobody remembers phone numbers anymore, yeah. or nobody knows the, any trivia because they can look it all up on Google. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, people actually did make that same complaint at the when when literacy arrives right you have when widespread literacy widespread that yeah. you have people saying oh no one's going to remember stuff anymore because we've got you know not everyone should learn to read there was that mm -hmm. this this argument made that not everyone should learn to read because it would destroy memory it would destroy your faculty of memory things and to be fair they were right it yeah, did yeah. <laughs> i mean people became less good at remembering things the important thing is to say what did we lose and what did we gain yeah. Not remembering things. Did it ruin us as a species or did our ability to write more things down in books than anyone could ever remember help us as a species? Well, and we couldn't have had the kind of technological explosion that we did without writing it simply. Because it it's all very well to remember things, but if you can't express them to other people yeah. or write them down so that 20 Someone years later or later, yeah, 50 can years can later can find your it. your idea, which had no practical application at the time, but is mm -hmm. suddenly really important. But it would have disappeared if it had never mm -hmm. been written down. Exactly. So just to say that the complaints that happen now may be true in the sense that, yes, people probably are changing their cognitive abilities in response to technology. But that doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't. It's neither good nor bad, really, until we see what comes of it. And we'll, we, will, we will lose certain abilities, but we will gain other ones, too. Right. So... And the, the question is, how good is the trade-off? Not, is there a trade-off? There's always a trade-off. Okay, that wandered a little bit further yeah. from the, yeah. <laughs> the content of the video. But I mean, if you, if you do see the videos, you'll see the way that I use visual representation mm -hmm. with this cognitive mapping, uh, concept mapping rather, I should say, to visually represent the uh, the way that things are kind of associated yeah so you can remember them maybe not as physical these aren't physical locations in space mm -hmm. but they are here's one thing which reminds you of six other things because yeah. there there's some link whether a causal link or any other kind mm -hmm. of link just happen at the same time or whatever and here's so there's clusters of things that are linked together and then those clusters become linked themselves mm -hmm. and that builds into a larger and larger set of associations. So when you think of Tennyson, you think of the Crimean War, and you think of Penny Dreadfuls, and you think of poetry, and you think of medievalism, and you think of Sherlock Holmes, you, all of these things, even though Tennyson is directly connected to all of those things, there's this link between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's funny, you know, it's a bit of anecdotal evidence, but I've often found students will remember this obscure little thing that I made some usually amusing little connection between two things just as an aside. And they'll remember that, but then maybe have trouble remembering the sort of core material that I was trying to, to give them. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows the way that memory sometimes works. Yeah. If, if you have that associative link, it makes it easier to remember. Yeah. I mean, an obvious example of that in my teaching life is uh, vocabulary memorization for Latin. Right. On the one hand, yes, you make obvious connections like here's the Latin word and here's the English word that comes from it or here's the French word that comes from it and that helps you remember it, sure. But sometimes you make completely, and I do this all the time, make completely unrelated connections in your head between the sound of a word and a different thing or some amusing, vague connection between a Latin word and something else. And that, that association is how you remember it not because of anything to do with what it actually means. And I share those with my students all the time. Not that the, all of them are going to work for them because they become very personalized. The associations need to be exactly the way you remember them or they don't work. Right. But some little random connection that I make about how a word, what a word means or how to remember what its form is or something might just be the one that catches for a student. So I share them all the time. And also just to show them that that's the way to think about it, to not try to just memorize it in some vacuum, it, getting back to the original point you made, that these words, just like everything else, don't exist in a vacuum, and that our brains are really bad at learning information when it's isolated. Yeah. That if the information is completely isolated from any context or any structure, it doesn't stick. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to keep it there. Well, and that um, 
that language software that quiz the me- software that memorized, you've yeah. kind of utilizes that to, to exactly extent. it uses and it's a bunch of different ways but one of the things is it'll put flashcards up but the flashcards are not or images you can associate anything and it can be something that's what it means or something that's what it sounds like or something totally different just a thing that happens to catch as this is what will remind me and you make that association and then that gives you a piece of context to hang the information on well, I think that's enough rambling about the video for today and other associated pieces of information. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. For more information, check out the website www.alliterative.net where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avon Sarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or go to the feed on the website. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.